We've been looking at how music uh, develops in its various styles and forms. And uh, in our last session, we talked about the controversy that goes on in the church today over what kind of music is most suitable to accompany uh, the people of God in their worship. And part of that controversy has to do with the appearance in some circles of the invasion of worldliness into the house of God. I don't remember whether I mentioned earlier that I was recently at a large Christian convention where uh, <clears throat> several thousand people came together for a two-hour service on Sunday morning, and when it was written up afterwards for those delegates, uh, the mention was made of that part of the worship service uh, which was described as the entertainment part of the worship service. And we've seen this move in church music to reach out to a, a more and more secularized world as a means of evangelism to speak to people in their own language, to give them music that they can relate to, that they're familiar with. And some people will often cite a statement that was supposedly made by Luther, but it wasn't. Uh, why should the devil have all the good music and that the argument is that Luther got his music in the bars of Germany, which couldn't be further from the truth. Luther was a true musician, and he did not borrow music from the alehouses or so of, of Germany. But in any case, we're, we had this whole concept of worship now called seeker-sensitive worship, where we design worship to make it more attractive to the unbeliever. And part of that is rooted in the uh, evangelistic tradition of American mass evangelism, where at evangelistic rallies and meetings, uh, music other than traditional hymnody was used. Special music was there to help support the evangelist, and it was music that the public could relate to without having been steeped in Christian heritage. And that music was seen as being somewhat uh, effective in helping this whole ministry of evangelism. But then the question becomes, what's the purpose of worship on Sunday morning? Is it to do evangelism? Or is it the gathering together, the assembling together of the saints for worship? Because the difference is, if we see Sunday morning as an evangelistic outreach mission, or we see it as a worship service, however we look at it, we'll, in, in the final analysis, determine how we structure it. And I'm convinced that the purpose of Sunday morning worship, Sabbath worship, as established early on in redemptive history, was for the edification of the people of God. Now, those people were supposed to then go out into the highways and byways and do the work of evangelism, but the primary function of Sunday morning worship is to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. The other thing that disturbs me about the nomenclature of, of seeker-sensitive worship is that it makes the assumption that people who are unbelievers are seeking after God, when the Bible tells us without any ambiguity that the unbeliever is not seeking after God, but is seeking the benefits that only God can give him, while at the same time fleeing as fast as they can from the immediate presence of God. So there's a theology there that also dictates that. But the amazing thing is that, that, that certain forms of worship that began with certain theological structures driving them have crossed the street and now permeated uh, communities, Christian communities, where the theology is vastly different from the theological uh, environment in which these things originated. And so today, people are making no connection between their understanding of God and their understanding of how He is to be approached in worship, and I think that's a very serious problem. But what I want us to see in the broader application of the Christian in the arts is not just this uh, immediate question of how we worship God on Sunday morning, but that we need to understand the relationship between art and culture. I wrote a book uh, not too long ago called The Consequences of Ideas, following the History of Philosophy course that I taught in here. And uh, the publisher wanted me to name the book Twelve Men Who Changed the World. But because I uh, addressed more than 12 thinkers, uh, 
in this book. I chose to call it Consequences of Ideas, although I focused attention on 12 people whose philosophical ideas have had major, major uh, influence and impact on Western culture. And again, the title, The Consequences of Ideas, is this, that philosophical systems that are created by intellectuals that create a, an alternate, alternative life and worldview from traditional worldviews have an impact on culture because people behave the way they think and they behave according to how they perceive the world and how they understand life. And so the history of philosophy is the history of the articulation of competing systems of thought or of worldviews that are usually created in a very heavy intellectual ivory tower background where we wonder whether they have any relevance whatsoever to culture. Now for the most part, and I'm painting with a broad brush here, for the most part in the history of Western civilization, the way the technical ideas of the philosophers have gotten down from the ivory tower and into the market to public square and into those areas by which culture is shaped is through the intermediaries called artists. That if you study the history of painting, if you study the history of music, if you study the history of architecture, if you study the history of any of the arts, you will soon see how plain it is that movements in the world of art tend to follow shifts in the world of philosophy. That is to say, the history of art mirrors the history of philosophy. When rationalism reigned supreme in the 17th century, it's manifested by the artists' uh, uh, neoclassicism in their uh, framework in music and in, in, in writing and all the rest. And you just see this throughout Western history. And so it's the artists, I believe, who are the real change agents that introduce these ideas into the culture. So we don't want to think for a minute that that the popular music, the, the literature that we read, the artist, artistry or the painting that we see has no philosophical content. On the contrary, these styles and forms of art are delivery mechanisms to awaken people to a whole way of thinking and a whole way of acting. That's why I say we have to be very careful what we borrow from the secular world and bring in to the Christian life, not just in terms of music, but also in terms of, of, of paintings, art, uh, architecture, and most of all, literature. So I want to speak, so spend some time today talking about literature as an art form. Now, one of the finest works I've ever written, read on this subject is one I have with me today, written by Jean Edward Veith, entitled Reading Between the Lines. Now, uh, and the subheading is A Christian Guide to Literature. And Jean, uh, or Ed really is the way he goes by, is the, uh, he's the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences and is professor of English at Concordia University in Wisconsin. He's a Lutheran scholar. And this book is just fantastic in its evaluation of what's going on in our culture today and what are the historical roots of the uh, cultural shifts with respect to literature. And at the beginning of this book, Ed talks about the shift in the way people approach literature in America. I mentioned earlier that we had a distinction in our schools between literacy and illiteracy. And we define literacy as the ability to read and write. But in the contemporary postmodern culture, Dr. Beath talks about ah literacy. 
to describe this phenomenon in our age. Ah literacy refers to people who have the ability to read and to write but choose not to. They're not interested in the Word, in the written Word. Rather, these people prefer to respond to images rather than to read books with sentences and paragraphs and words. That we've become more and more nonverbal where we respond now to sounds and sound bites on television. Political campaigns are run not on the basis of somebody giving a carefully reasoned argument that is articulated uh, in a lengthy speech, but rather into short, uh, interesting sound bites that, uh, with images, with image uh, uh, studies being made to what kind of image the marketplace will respond to, and so on. This is part of the legacy of television, obviously, which changed our habits. When, uh, when we had radios and only radios, we had to use our imagination to uh, follow the storyline that we were hearing uh, on the radio. But then the, with the video, with the visual coming along, the images were supplied for us. And it's so much uh, less uh, taxing to sit there and watch a show than it is to take, take up a book and read it with any seriousness. And so this is strange, and this is a real crisis for Christians, because for Christians, we are from all, from all time back people of the Word. I read a statistic not too long ago, and I don't know how accurate these statistics are and how people come to this, but I guess they know how, what they're doing. But market research indicated that only 4% of Americans walk into a bookstore, either religious or secular, in a given year to per and actually purchase a book to read, 4%. That is, 96 people out of 100 in our culture in a given year never walk in a bookstore and purchase a book for reading. Now, this statistic was before it could be done on the Internet, so it's not that this is just a difference between Internet uh, consumption and uh, retail stores. But it really says something about where reading uh, functions in our culture. And if you go into your local bookstore and then begin to see what are the best sellers in terms of what the 4% who do read are reading, that doesn't give us a whole lot more in, to be encouraged about. Because the literature that is found in the marketplace again reflects the neo-paganism of the secular culture. In Paul's letter to the Philippians, he makes this statement, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, Whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That we are supposed to meditate on things of virtue, which is hard to do when you're reading a lot of contemporary literature, particularly the novel. As long as I've been alive, I've been a voracious reader. Long before I was a Christian, I used to read sports books and Oh, ocean books. In fact, when I was a kid, I read every single book in our town's library on sports, even if it was ping pong. I didn't care, just as long as it had something to do with sports. And I just, the lady that was the librarian, you know, thought I was kind of weird because I just couldn't get enough. And I'm one of the, I was one of those kids that had St. Vitus dance. My dad said, he said, you can't sit still for two minutes. If I wasn't out running and playing, I wanted to have a book with me. I wanted to do something. And I was the one then, and still am, that I can't sit at a breakfast table without having something to read. If it's only the stuff on the back of the cereal box, I want to read it. I know that that isn't all that interesting, but just the way I am. I love to read. I've always loved to read. And, uh, and so I always, in addition to reading within my field, I'm always reading uh, novels and particularly mystery stories. I love whodunits. But you read these novels today, 
And it seems like you can't pick up fiction without being immediately confronted by the most grotesque, vulgar, violent, obscene, purient literature. It's as if in the publishing industry, if you're going to publish fiction, you have a moral obligation to include within it some kind of salacious material. And many people are addicted to this as a vicarious form of sexual fantasy to be engaged in reading books of this sort. Now, again, I like the mystery stuff, but you know, you just get the, it's just like television, movies. You don't want to say, come on, let's get on with it and get on with the story. We don't need this stuff. And you didn't have to have it in, in the earlier forms of television and, and movies where you could see a movie, have the storyline and, and appreciate it without ever having to see a bedroom scene. And we have lapsed into a literary form that I call obscene. Now, Jean, or Ed Veith, talks about the roots of language such as terms like obscenity, pornography, vulgarity, uh, blasphemy, sacrilege, and so on. And uh, you take the word obscene, which is uh, a very pictorial word, and it comes from the ancient Greek, and it means off stage. If somebody was going to be murdered or perish in war, in the classical theater, the actors would leave the stage, and then somebody would come as a messenger and give the bad news that the character had been slain, had been murdered, or whatever because it was felt, even in ancient pagan culture, to be obscene to show that uh, right in front of the audience, which would appeal not to their aesthetic sense, but to more base animalistic impulses in the audience. And the dramatist did not want his art to be compromised by gore and by violence. Can compare that and contrast that with the modern motion picture with its obligatory commitment to violence, which is gratuitous. And then you have pornography, or pornography, which means immoral writing, or or, or images. Uh, Graphics means writing, but in this case, and and, and I can remember when I was in college, we had a, a hardened war correspondent as an English professor who was exceedingly hostile to Christianity and taught a course in creative writing for English majors. And I had a close friend who was a Christian who submitted a short story for uh, evaluation from this professor. And the professor said, there's not enough realism in there. This isn't how people live. People, you have to describe people in their eroticism and so on to pass this course. And so he came to the guys in the dorm and he was somewhat naive in terms of his background. He had led something of a sheltered life, and so he just made a collection of the most filthy descriptive terms that the guys could come up with on the, on the floor of the dorm. I saw this happen. And so he rewrote his story and made it as filthy as he possibly could. And I remember when he came back with his, his revision, and the mark on his paper was A+, plus, and the teacher said, I didn't know you had it in you. And that was the thing. If you're really going to be realistic, then you have to include all of these things in the literature of the day. I once uh, wrote a screenplay uh, for a production company in Hollywood and met with the uh, members of the studio and so on. And they liked the screenplay very much, but they wanted to change the dialogue to make it as filthy as they possibly could. And I said, no. I said, why do you have to do that? He said, because that's what sells. He said, that's what people expect these days. You have to use uh, this language enough to meet their expectations. And I said, you know, what's the difference between that and pure pornography? I mean, if all you're trying to do is 
excite their uh, sexual impulses and miss the whole message of this uh, film that we've written and taken time to craft. I said, I'm not interested in that. And, but that was where the expectation was. And in one sense, the publishing houses are simply giving the public what the market research indicates the public wants and the public expects. And the public itself is vulgar, and so it expects vulgarity in the written page and in their written expression. But in addition, I mean, I people say, if you look at the Bible, you'll see earthy language in the Bible. There are vulgarisms in sacred uh, scripture. Even the Apostle Paul, at times, to make a point, will use a vulgar expression to accent the point that he's making. You will never see the Apostle Paul use obscenities or pornography. And the last thing that you would ever find from the pen of the Apostle Paul would be blasphemy. And yet if there's anything that permeates the modern culture, it is the acceptability of blasphemy in virtually every art form that we encounter in our day. Just the other day, I watched uh, a program on television which was inside, I think, the, the actor's studio or something like that, where they interview famous actors. And this was a fascinating interview of a well-known British actor, a British actor whose work I've very much uh, admired over the years. And in the casual conversation, he, the, the host asked him a question. He says, well, for Christ's sake, I don't do that, you know? And I thought, I was, I, I was stunned that I was listening to people talking about art who had to resort to blasphemy to communicate their ideas. But that's where the culture is. And that, that's nowhere more evidenced or reflected than in the presence of the great American novel today. But literature in our day involves more than fiction. It also involves poetry. It involves nonfiction where there the, uh, the issue has to do with truth. And I'm going to talk more about the standards of literature and how they've changed over the years and uh, what, the, what, what has happened historically as philosophical systems change and we've moved into postmodernism and the postmodern world expects a whole different type of communication. And so we shouldn't be shocked by the way in which literature has degenerated. And so that now there's a great divide between Christian literature and uh, secular literature. In fact, we have two distinct marketplaces and two distinct annual conventions between the secular booksellers and the Christian publishers. And I remember when Francis Schaeffer wrote his book, uh, When Shall We, uh, How Shall We Then Live, that uh, it outsold dramatically Jane Fonda's workout book. And, uh, and for weeks, Jane Fonda's workout book was number one on the New York Times bestsellers list, and Schaefer's work was never even mentioned, even though in the marketplace it had greatly outsold Jane Fonda. But that's because it's two different worlds. There's the pagan world, and there's the Christian world. And that has produced a crisis for the American Christian artist. How do you cross the street? How do you penetrate that secular culture? Because in one sense, we've been shut out. But we'll talk more about that in our next session.